Lecture 2, The Rise of Western Science At the same time the dominant political form of monarchy was being re-examined, a new approach to examining the physical world was developing into a method, the scientific method. In tracing the rise of the scientific method and explaining its concept of created matter, we will first examine how the combination of two philosophical approaches to reality, rationalism and empiricism, contributed to the foundation upon which the scientific method would later develop from. Then we will look at a number of people who promoted this method, Nicholas Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton, and William Harvey. We will conclude this lecture by admiring a few examples from the neoclassical artistic era that overlaps with time that the scientific road, scienti that the scientific progress rose to prominence. Rationalism and Empiricism René Descartes René Descartes lived from 1596 to 1650. He was a French philosopher and mathematician who grounded certainty of his existence in his ability to think. In concluding this, he wrote, For since I discovered one which I knew to be true, I thought that I must likewise be able to discover the ground of this certitude. And as I observe that in the words I think, therefore I am, there is nothing at all which gives me assurance of their truth beyond this, that I see very clearly that in order to think it is necessary to exist. I concluded that I might take as a general rule the principle that all the things which we very clearly and distinctly conceive are true, only observing, however, that there is some difficulty in rightly determining the objects which we distinctly conceive. End of quote. This manner of establishing truth in the individual represents a shift that was occurring during Descartes' time of relying more on the ability of the individual person to reason and less on external authority to provide reasons for individuals. The skepticism of Descartes became an element in the scientific method which does not assume that an explanation is true simply because an authority says it is, but rather only accepts the explanation as probable after a number of experiments yield similar results. Francis Bacon Francis Bacon was a contemporary of Descartes. He was an English philosopher and scientist. Bacon fo focused less on philosophical, logical reasoning and more on gathering empirical data in order to determine to what extent hypothesis accurately explains reality. In his work Novum Organum, he attempts to find a mean between skepticism and what he refers to as a dogmatic approach to nature. Both extremes can be avoided, claimed Bacon, by empirically testing in a systematic manner a proposed explanation for how a particular aspect of nature operates. Bacon explains his scientific method by writing, We must not only search for and procure a great number of experiments, but also introduce a completely different method, order, and progress of continuing and promoting experience. For vague and arbitrary experience is, as we have observed, mere groping in the dark, and rather astonishes than instructs. But when experience shall proceed regularly and uninterruptedly by a determined rule, we may entertain better hopes of the sciences. End of quote. Promoters of the scientific method. The empirically based scientific method for in the words of Francis Bacon, determining the degrees of certainty, gained many practitioners and devotees. We will now focus on a few. Nicholas Copernicus. Nicholas Copernicus lived from 1473 to 1543. He was a mathematician and astronomer and born in the Kingdom of Poland during the late 15th century. In his book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, he supported a heliocentric theory of the universe. According to the heliocentric theory of the universe, the Earth and other planets revolve around the Sun. In Greek, helios means Sun, and not vice versa. This theory is an ancient one, proposed as far back by a Greek mathematician and astronomer Aristarchus a few centuries before the birth of Christ. According to an ancient text of the Greek mathematician and physicist Archimedes, Aristarchus held that, I quote, you are aware, you being King Gellon, that universe is the name given by most astronomers 
to the sphere, the center of which is the center of the earth, while its radius is equal to the straight line between the center of the sun and center of the earth. This is the common account, as you have heard from the astronomers. But Aristarchus brought out a book consisting of a certain hypothesis, where it appears, as a consequence of the assumptions made, that the universe is many times greater than the universe just mentioned. His hypothesis are that the fixed stars and the sun remain unmoved, that the earth revolves around the sun in the circumference of a circle, the sun lying in the middle of the orbit. End of quote. Despite that the heliocentric theory was many, many centuries years old, most scientists at the time of Copernicus held that the sun revolves around the earth. This geocentric model was very early on proposed by Ptolemy, a Greco-Egyptian. He lived from 90 to 168 AD. Unlike in the case of Galileo, the Catholic Church did not correct Copernicus. This was because Copernicus did not present his heliocentric view as a fact, but rather as a possible explanation that was not yet sufficiently proven. The Church's acceptance of Copernicus' research is apparent in the forward of to Copernicus' 1453 book on the revolution of the celestial spheres. The forward contains a 1536 letter from Cardinal Schoenberg, and in your transcript I include that letter. And in the letter, Cardinal Schoenberg praises Copernicus and his research. Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe lived from 1546 to 1601. He was a Danish astronomer who disagreed with both the Ptolemaic geocentric model and the Copernican heliocentric model. His model for explaining the universe is a combination of these two models. His model has since been disproven. Johannes Kepler. The German astronomer Johannes Kepler, although respecter of Tycho Brahe's observations, built his whole astronomy upon Copernicus's hypothesis concerning the world. He improved Copernicus's heliocentric model by incorporating elliptical orbits into the explanation, thereby more accurately identifying and predicting planetary orbits. The Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei also back Copernicus's explanation for how the planets and stars interact with one another. Unfortunately, in promoting Copernicus's hypothesis, Galileo took liberties to mock those, including the Pope, who wanted Galileo to be more cautious in how he presented this hypothesis. Many held that there was not sufficient evidence for Copernicus's hypothesis. Furthermore, since Galileo lived during the time when Protestant reformers were teaching sola scriptura, the Catholic Church did not want to even appear to promote an established fact, a hypothesis that contradicted Scripture's phenomenological description of the sun rotating around the earth. Not heeding or respecting church officials' caution, Galileo wrote a book, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, in which the character, character Simplicio, means simpleton, speaks words that the reigning pope, Urban the eighth had actually said. Galileo's mockery of the papacy angered Pope Urban the eighth so much that within a relatively short time, Galileo was brought to trial, found suspect of heresy, forced to recount, and placed under house arrest. Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton lived from 1642 to 1727. The English math, and he was an English mathematician and physicist. He was born in the same year that Galileo died, relied on both Galileo's research and theories and Kepler's research and theories in order to develop his own. Studying Kepler's laws of planetary motion greatly helped Newton to formulate laws on motion and on gravitation. Newton's three laws of motions are all based on one principle. Material things move according to the same physical law. This foundational principle that seems obvious to our modern ears was not obvious at the time of Newton. During Newton's age, many scientists followed Aristotle's assumption that bodies that are heavy tend to go downwards, bodies that are light tend to go upwards, the stars and planets move in circles, and that in order for something to be moved, motion needs to be continually imparted to it. Aristotle's conclusions are based on what he observed with his senses. For example, 
What motion do you expect from smoke? And what motion do you expect from a rock that is dropped? Challenging Aristotle's call it as you see it approach to nature, Newton argued that every material object continues in either a state of rest or motion unless affected by force. The degree of change in motion of an object in motion is proportional to the force acting on it, and every action always entails an equal and opposite reaction. William Harvey We will now turn our attention to a scientist, the English physicist William Harvey, lived from 1578 to 1657. William Harvey did not focus his intelligence in explaining how the stars and planets move, but rather how the human body functions, specifically how blood circulates from the heart to the body and back to the heart. Harvey's discoveries challenged another view of the time that can be traced back to Galen. According to the ancient Greek physician Galen, the liver produces blood. Neoclassical Art the art that coincides with the rise of the scientific method is called neoclassical because, once again, artists were inspired by ancient Greek and Roman art. Jacques-Louis David lived from 1748 to 1825. David was a French painter who adopted the neoclassical style and not the highly decorative Rococo style that you were introduced to earlier. One of his paintings, The Oath of Horatii, is based on an ancient Roman legend recording in Livy's History of Rome. According to this legend, the people of Rome, the people of Alba, decided to settle a feud by choosing three men from each city. Once chosen, the three men from the city of Rome were to fight the three men from the city of Alba. Another painting by David, called The Death of Socrates, also depicts a snapshot from ancient life but this time from Greece. The great philosopher Socrates was found guilty of corrupting Athenian young with bad ideas. His punishment was to kill himself by drinking hemlock, and that is what David portrays. Antonio Canova lived from 1757 to 1822. He's also considered by some as neoclassical. One of his beautiful works, which is also in a way romantic as well, is Cupid Kissing Psyche. The painting was inspired by a myth that appears in the Latin novel Metamorphosis by Apuleius. Benjamin Latrobe. Benjamin Latrobe was a British neoclassical architect who immigrated to the USA. In the US, he fostered an American neoclassical style. One of his most famous works is the Baltimore Basilica of the National Shrine of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. God bless.